Hello everyone and welcome to my channel Knitted Art History where I'm sitting uh, telling you some art history stories while knitting and well, welcome to another night episode <laughs> we finally have light so you know, so I'm uh, like recording it very very fast uh, well, to edit it and to put it on my channel as fast as possible so yes, yeah, so well hello <laughs> don't mind my shenanigans again on the background i um, you know I, again i had some visions and well whatever <laughs> yeah i'm gonna be just sitting talking with you i don't want to need anything i don't want to do anything and i mean it's it's quite late already uh so so i'm actually to be honest a bit falling asleep but i mean who knows how the light will be tomorrow maybe we won't have it whole day so yeah so, as I promised, today we're going to be talking about another, well, artist, a woman artist, Ukrainian woman artist. But she's not a very, like, well-known artist, and I, I myself found out about her pretty, like, accidentally, basically. Just saw some um, article about her and was like, oh, wow, interesting, and, uh, well, and found her actually also very interesting. So, yeah. So I'm not gonna be talking much. Let's dive in straight into into her uh, into her life. So, Maria Bashkirtseva is the character of our story today. Uh, so she was born in the well in a village uh, uh, in the in Poltava region. So it is like it's uh, central Ukraine, and it was under the uh, Russian Empire back then. Uh, she was born in 1858. So had a very short life, but very productive. So she was born so, uh, in quite wealthy family. Her father, Kostyantin Bashkirtso, he uh, was a son of uh, one of the generals, so well-known generals apparently back then, uh, and very wealthy. Her mom, she was, um, her mom also Maria, uh, Maria Babanina. And uh, so in this part, in this first part of the video, I will be calling uh, Maria, like Maria the mother, so I'll be calling her Maria, and Maria Bashkirtza, the artist that we're talking about today, I'll be calling her Musa for the first time. And I, I mean, pretty, a little bit like disrespectful, to be honest, but uh, well, uh, for, you know, for there um, to not be any confusions. Uh, so, and this is how, you know, her family called her Musa. Musa's uh, parents. They got married, and it was said that uh, by love, so there, there was not an uh, arranged marriage. They genuinely loved each other. However, unfortunately, uh, the marriage didn't work out. So Kostantin um, Bashkirtsev, he was a very, like, well, um, he was cheating, he was, uh, like, partying all the time, he was uh, spending a lot of money on some nonsense and stuff like this. In one of resources I even saw that um, he might actually have brought uh, syphilis at home, but I saw it just in one resources, so I, like, again, taking it with a pinch of salt, but I mean, uh, considering what type of lifestyle he led, uh, I think it's not a surprise, right? Uh, so, uh, because of that, uh, Maria Babanina, she decided that she can't handle it anymore and uh, she decided to divorce him. And at this point, already they had two children together, so it's Musa, Maria Bashkirtseva, and her uh, brother. don't know the name of the brother. And uh, she des so, so uh, Maria Babanina, the mother, she decided to divorce uh, uh, her husband and and well she actually won the trial which was a super you know unique thing back then uh, and especially in Russian Empire uh, so she won uh, the trial and as we can say in modern words got full custody uh, on her kids uh, and and so she took the kids and uh, moved back to her family house family mansion and uh, there is also this little like rumors i understand that uh when um maria babanina she like the mother she was young uh she met some profiter and he told her that your son will be well just like every other person like basically average but your daughter she'll be the star so <laughs> very interesting thing considering that well 
uh, Maria Bashkirtseva indeed became a star. They, they moved out from like on the father's uh, mansion, they divorced and stuff like that. And well, apparently they had some kind of confrontations after that still. And at the end of the day, they decided that uh, the son will be staying with father and uh, Maria Babanina, she will take Musa, Musa with her. And uh, they decided to, when all of this was uh, arranged, uh, Babanina, uh, the, the mother's side, ba Babanini, they decided uh, to move out abroad, to completely go out of the country. Uh, so they left their uh, family mansion uh, to some of the distant relatives and they well, took basically everyone. <laughs> so it's um, Maria and Maria, uh, it's um, Musia's aunt with cousin, uh, they even took uh, the old grandpa with, with them, uh, Stepan Babanin, and uh, Stepan Babanin, or, or so, well, he is kind of also a pretty important figure, uh, so Musia was uh, uh, remembering him with uh, very warm heart and he you know he believed in her at this point more than anyone else and he indeed was you know pushing her to create some uh, amazing things and he believed that she will be an amazing thing herself in uh may of 1870 all of the family took out and moved abroad uh, they were traveling for two years through Europe, so they started in... Uh, first they got to Vienna, then they got to Baden-Baden, then to Gen Geneva. Then in 1872 they decided to settle down in France, uh, specifically in Nice. So they um, settled down there and they lived there for the next seven years. Musia, Maria Bashkirtseva, she's 12 years old now, and when they came to Nice and they settled down there, she started to write her uh, famous diaries. So at this point now, she is mostly famous as a uh, writer rather than painter. Obviously, we'll be mentioning a bit about these diaries, and I haven't read it myself, uh, I'll be honest. Uh, so I, I, to be honest, I don't even know, I didn't even Google, uh, Google whether there uh, they are online or not. She started to write these um, diaries uh, in Nice. Uh, well, she's just 12 year old. Very, you know, she, you know, she was a very smart and uh, unique kid. And uh, a lot of, uh, well, right now, in, in uh, those who are reading her diaries, they're getting very surprised that, well, 12 year old child could not write this type of thing, but, well, apparently they could. So she was kind of, you know, a philosopher, a thinker, as we can say. She, starting from this very young age, she already, you know, she knew uh, the price of her of herself, and she knew, starting from a very young age, that uh, she is, uh, well, she wants to create something big and be remembered. I was created for titles, fame, recognition, popularity everywhere. These are my dreams. She was, as I said, a very, very rich person, and her family was a very rich, rich, rich family. So they were never in need, and thus, you know, she could, uh, like, she was able to do whatever she wanted. Well, you know, on, on the contrary to a lot of rich kids, she decided to put all of this into traveling, into uh, studying. She was very curious of everything and as i said she wanted you know to uh, to learn everything and uh, well and also at this age she's very young she was thinking a lot about falling in love and stuff like this but still however she was right and get married and have a bunch of kids why not but every laundress is able to do it what do i want you know i want fame so you see <laughs> Very, like, determined person, very determined child. So, as I said, she was taking this money and using her privilege not to just party and do stuff like that, to be lazy, you know, basically not doing anything, being kind of like a parasite. She decided to study, to um, teach, uh, like, herself everything that, she, that, that is possible. She, starting from this very young age, from like 12 year old, she was already, uh, you know, picking up some of the teachers for herself because well, she could, she could pay them. Uh, well, her parents, <laughs> her mom would pay this. And she was, um, so she was studying everything, starting from like literature and philosophy, ending with math, chemistry, because uh, she also believed that those are very important subjects. She was also learning uh, languages, so she fluently like speak the Ukrainian, Russian also obviously 
Uh, she knew English, she knew French, she knew Italian fluently. At some point, then it, when she became uh, 14, she started even to learn Greek and late Latin. So she started to read all of the philosophers, you know, and all the stuff um, in their original language, which is, I mean, impressive, right? So she was writing also that life is so beautiful and so fleeting. If I waste time, what will I become? <laughs> so again, she was very critical toward herself. So, you know, that might be why she was, uh, well, she became what, what she became, because, you know, she was, uh, well, she, kind of arrogant, kind of, you know, she loved herself a bit too much. But on the other hand, she also was really critical toward herself, you know, and it was a very, very good mix uh, for her. Until the age of 12, I was pampered, all my wishes were fulfilled, but they never took care of my upbringing. At the age of 12, I myself asked for teachers, made the program myself, and since then, I owe everything to myself. I independently decided on the hours of lessons, nine hours every day. Oh God, give me straight and preservance in my studies. Yes, I have straight, but I wish I had more of it. <laughs> and starting from a very early age also, when she was like very little, she also had, um, well, talent toward art different type of arts, not just paintings. Uh, firstly, she was very interested in music and well, as it's sad, is that remember that she actually had a very nice voice and a very good hearing. And uh, she even wrote in her diaries from 14 uh, July 1876 that she was um, uh, once uh, she got to some audition to the um, to, to apparently very popular back then uh, vocal teacher uh, Vettel uh, in France and he was very surprised about her and very satisfied with her and he said that oh, she has a very big future in, in the field of music and in the field of singing as she had a very good and beautiful voice and a part of singing she was also, she was also very talented with different instruments so she was playing harp in the first place she really liked this uh, uh, this instrument uh, she was playing guitar organ piano and well you know a um, bunch of different other instruments however she was you know at the end of the day she became more focused on art we'll talk in a bit uh, why? As I said also, they were traveling a lot with uh, with her family and in January of 1876 they even traveled to, well, to Italy, to Vatican and they, well, met the Pope uh, P. Ninth and here so was, there was a little like uh, love story, love episode uh, which ended very poorly uh so uh that was not like not her first uh, like falling in love so she was at this point she was a very lovable person you know she was like a young young attention seeking girl she was falling in love basically with everyone and uh she, here also there was no um no exceptions so she fell in love with uh pope's uh pope's uh nephew uh who Cardinal Pietro Antonelli. However, <laughs> uh, she uh, very quickly became uh, very disappointed at him because, um, after all, you know, Maria was told that she is, uh, you know, she is not noble enough. Her family is not noble enough. Plus, she was not a Catholic, so yeah, so basically, Cardinal rejected her, and well, it was, you know, it hurt her pride terribly, and she was very, like, mad, very mad at him. The same year, 1876, then uh, she got back to her, uh, well, where she was born to her to the village uh, Havrenci in Poltava region. As part you know, of her traveling program in Ukraine, also she visited uh, she visited a um, tell me not tell you she visited the residence uh, in the village Dukanka. Uh, so well, uh, unfortunately now this residence is destroyed, and it was destroyed back in 1917 because of revolution. She wrote about this that uh, for the beauty of the garden, park and buildings, Dikanka 
uh, rivals the Borghese and Doria villas in Rome. It is a pity that the world has no idea about the existence of this place. And uh, well, the Kanka is also, you know, it's a pretty famous <laughs> uh, village in Ukraine, like everyone knows it, because um, as I mentioned in previous video, um, we have this writer Hohol, Makola Hohol, and so he wrote the uh, the novel, how do you call it, Beginnings on a Farm Near uh, the Kanka, which are published with the Kanki. Uh, so, I mean, if you're, again, if you're familiar, I think, with uh, classical literature, so y you know this uh, uh, this uh, literature piece, no additional info. A part of that, she also briefly traveled to Kharkiv, she then to Kiev also, then she traveled a bit to the in different cities uh, than in uh, uh, like modern Russia. Um, but eventually she got back because mostly she, well, she came uh, there to her home, uh, homeland, to her home, uh, like, uh, mansion to spend uh, a bit time uh, with her father. Because, I mean, at this point, she, you know, she barely remember him, actually. And, you know, they barely know each other because she was very, very young when her mother took her. And uh, she, you know, the main goal was uh, to take uh, her father with them back to Nice, uh, back to France, uh, because she really wanted to, for her parents to get together, um, and get back together. And uh, she was, you know, she was showing off very much. Uh, so she took all of the best dresses that she can. She was showing like the best manners that she could. And I mean, her father was very blown away by her, about how, well, amazing young lady she grew up. And uh, she was also bashing a lot that, you know, he's spending a lot of money on some, like, on these unnecessary things that he need to start to leave. He need to start to, like, you know, travel or something like that and well at this point he is actually very like not an old person he's like just 30 45 years old and uh, she was you know like bashing bashing him that he's just sitting in his mansion in this uh in, in this home like always partying drinking champagne you know playing cards and something like that and uh she and she was telling that he need to come to france and stuff like that uh so he quickly understood what was the point for this travel but uh, at the end of the day uh, Musa she still was like uh, well yes it is like this also but a part of that I am actually the marriageable age and I need uh, a you know a full-fledged family uh, and a part of this I actually need uh, the patronage of my father and well this is how <laughs> Musa well, basically bought her father and he decided well okay fine let's go and well they came back together in france and uh, well apparently i saw that uh parents get back together or at least you know they arranged everything and they will maybe start to tolerate each other more i don't know uh, i don't know but well eventually they get back together well unfortunately in this period of time so she's like um 16 and uh, very bad news came to her because uh, she was now like officially diagnosed with tuberculosis so as far as i understood she had some kind of symptoms beforehand obviously so she had some kind of illnesses and stuff when they were like first traveling when they just got out of the country uh they were going also to different like retreat places and stuff like that but now she's like 16 and she officially the doctor said that um, yes, you have tuberculosis and, well, you don't really have a lot of time. But because of that, so as I mentioned about music career, uh, because of that, the music career completely you know, got off. Because uh, all of this pain and all of these things that was going on, she uh, started to lose her voice. And then in a few years, when like she became 18, uh, she started actually to go uh, a bit deaf. So she also started to lose her hearing. So, you know, the dream of becoming a famous singer was completely, like, gone. And thus she decided to focus on art. So when she turned 17, she moved to Paris uh, in January, January, January of 1877. Uh, so it's like... Uh, straight when she got back from Ukraine and she uh, as I said so she knows that she has tuberculosis and everything's 
bad with her singing career so she decided to focus on art and she got into um, a very famous back then uh, academy julien back then it was like the only place in paris where um, well, women were allowed to study art on her first day she's like this eccentric young lady and woman uh, that loves herself she uh, on purpose was late on her first class and when she came uh, so she wore crystal white dress for her first you know visit in the studio to paint white dress okay she was in a fur, fur coat something like that uh, so obviously when she came uh, well people was, was like very skeptical about her so it was you know not the best impression even though maybe she had uh, you know in, in her head she thought that it would be fine uh, and it was like impress someone but at the end of the day you know everyone just saw her as this um well very uh like um full of herself young lady that has like so much money that she doesn't know what to do with herself but she very quickly understood that well things will not work as she thought uh, first because in the uh, well in this academy julien you know everyone was working very very hard so there were no place for uh, lazy people if they were working you know crazy hours they were starting uh starting from 8 a.m uh, they were working then till noon. They would have like an hour of um, like break, and after that they would work till five in the evening. That's like an eight um, eight hour a day, like eight hour work day basically. Obviously, after this like first session, the first lesson that she got, she well this white dress was ruined completely. People were laughing at her, and well she was kind of you know I think a bit hurt about that. So she came back to back home that day. Uh, well, changed everything she understood what type of game was that and the next day she came on time uh, in a modest clothes well practical clothes and started uh well started to work and to work very very hard and from her first week uh, musa showed like amazing results and uh, she caused this sensation basically her teachers uh, like uh, painters uh, Couture, Jean Jérôme, Bonnat, and etc. They immediately understood and they immediately saw that the girl has talent and like neutral talent. And they, uh, well, they were so amazed about her that they were constantly talking about her with uh, Monsieur Julien, uh, the director, right? Uh, the founder. Uh, till the point that Monsieur Julien, he was like, well, I need to see this girl. <laughs> and she, uh, like, he came to the studio to see, like, this, uh, this Maria Bashkirtseva, or how he called her uh, Marie Russe, uh, which, well, I mean, not a very <laughs> appropriate maybe thing, but because she, you know, she was, like, why I'm talking to Ukraine, because she was, uh, you know, empathizing sometimes that she is ukrainian particularly not russian but well i mean back then uh, i get i mean it's still for some of you like you don't see any difference because apparently you know there's no difference also between french and english right between i don't know uh, italian and spanish people right uh so so yeah so she she was called marie russe but well, whatever uh, you know, different times and uh, well so he came to the studio and he was also very blown away about the talent of this girl and um, quote from him that it seemed to me that her studies are the whim of a spoiled child but i must admit that she really works she has willpower and is generously gifted if this continues in three months her drawings can be accepted at the salon uh, so the salon is this um uh, is an uh, exhibition that was held like every year uh, where a lot of different artists would you know were able to show their works and a part of this so she like he was complimenting her constantly you know and like pushing her to work hard and he was also telling you know he was not believing that she never you know professionally was like painted or draw anything before that uh, however, Maria, uh, she was very critical towards herself and she was writing that Painting makes me despair. <laughs> After all, I have a talent capable of creating miracles and meanwhile, in terms of knowledge, I seem to be nothing. <laughs> so you see, like super critical, but you know, it it pushed her. It was a uh, good critique of herself, a very, you know, um, 
uh, objective critique of herself and it pushed her to work, work hard, hard, hard and to, you know, to develop her skills even more. She was working, you know, she started to work not just like eight hours a day, she was working sometimes for 12, 14 hours a day. And this is like, mind you, she has the tuberculosis and in like a pretty bad state. So she's constantly, uh, you know, she's constantly going on, on some of retreats and stuff like that. So she was in like her in a very poor health condition her main uh artist her main teacher's artist uh in this academy was uh, two artists uh tony robert fleury and also jules bastien lepage uh, bastien lepage especially so i understood they were especially close she was like as i said so she was very sick but she was still she was sometimes uh, spending nights uh, like in front of e of uh, easel and this is again because she you know had this thing she was punishing herself for you know senselessly like wasting time and that she started to draw so late and she's well all of this started so late that she and, and now she doesn't really have a lot of time she was writing that how didn't i start painting earlier how many years have been lost so i mean I think it's understandable, right? I think I also would have this type of feelings if I would find out, you know, that I have tuberculosis and in like a very bad state and there's like, um, you know, I, I might survive, but I might not. So, you know, I might live for like next year or next decade. <laughs> so, you know, so I really understand this feelings of this complete despair. This is some strong mentality we can th we can say. She didn't give up and was like, well, I mean, I will die soon, so I will not do anything. I will be, you know, parasiting just on my family's money. Um, however, she decided, no, I, like, you know, she was sick into the idea that I want to be famous. I want everyone to know me. And she started to work, work, work. After, like, 11 months of studying in uh, Julien's Academy, she finally got her first, uh, so her place in the salon. And she uh, started to present her works. And uh, even, uh, so there were even articles written about her work specifically. And uh, this in these articles was written that, uh, you know, this works, like, um, these works are so good that this, those works are for young men, you know, because they have the nerve, they have the nature and stuff like this, you know, because, well, basically, women were not able to produce such things. And so it, it's at this point that she started to lose her hearing because of you know how much she was working uh, and her body started to you know give up a bit uh, but still it didn't stop her and also she you know she started to have a very uh, very bad chest ache uh, and well till the point it was like so bad that she uh, well she really needed to stop at some point to paint uh, well at least for uh, for a bit and to go to a retreat because it was you know it was getting so so bad she was working so so hard she was also writing die <laughs> this is too wild but it seems to me i must die because i couldn't live i am abnormally created there is a lot of excess in me at the same time too much is missing such a character is short-lived and then what about my future my glory well of course then it's all over the academic competition in 1879 so she won a medal and uh, she uh, actually surpassed uh, her like um senior students uh, which was you know, a very unique thing uh the, because you know the members of jury they saw her work and they uh, you know they made this decision uh unanimously uh another thing like spectacular thing that she finished this I mean, this the, the art course in Academie Julien was uh, for seven years. She finished this just in two. And obviously, with each salon that she was taking part in, uh, the attention toward Maria Bashkirta was growing, growing, growing. However, not everything was so bright and so good as I'm describing, because uh, when she started to present her works uh, on the salon and these exhibitions, she actually needed to take a pseudonym. So due to certain you know, social circumstances at this point, she exhibited at this um, Paris Salon 1880 
under the pseudonym of uh, Mademoiselle Marie Russe. So her works were, you know, people were very pleased with her, art critics were very pleased with her, uh, especially, uh, well, uh, some kind of sensation was made with a painting a portrait of Mademoiselle Dina or young woman reading La Question du Divorce uh, and, well, as I said, was very, very uh, well received. Uh, and this is, you know, this uh, La Question du Divorce, a uh, question about the divorce. Uh, it was, uh, well, back then a popular book that was written by Alexandre Dumas' son. And at some point, so, you know, this painting just got lost somehow, uh, but then in 2012 it reappeared somehow at Sotheby's <laughs> and was, uh, well, at Sotheby's auction and it was sold for very good money uh, and, well, Sotheby's is, is usually, you know, there is usually all of a sudden finding out some things uh, but uh, yeah. Then uh, on the Salon of 1881 she also received a prize but this time the second prize and uh, she presented a, um, a large panel in Julien's studio, a women artist. And time was changing, but <laughs> the morals still, you know, stayed still. And uh, the values of the bourgeois world, they remained intact still. And from year to year in this Salon Sauve in 1881, 83, 84, she was forced to take pseudonyms. So at this point, her um, like family, family doctor, he was already at this point where he was begging uh, Maria to stop <laughs> and to take care of her health. Uh, but, you know, she was very determined. She still was like, she had some aim and she was, well, walking to this aim. She was, you know, she was studying and she was gaining even more and more skills and people started to get even more and more engaged in her art and she was presenting even, like, better and better works. And and especially um, people was fond of her work Self-Portrait. Uh, Self-Portrait with a palette and a harp. And uh, so this work attracted the attention of professionals to the young artist as it uh, testified to a new level of her art artistic ambitions. And then, you know, the work of the last years of her of her life showed some kind of departure from a dark tone to a lighter pal palette, which, uh, well, undoubtedly happened under the influence of her teacher and good friend, uh, Jules Bastien Lepage. Uh, a part of painting, she also tried a bit herself in sculpture, so uh, she created a sculptured... Um, New Sikaya, or if I butchered this so much, uh, so she created this one in 1882, and well, as as, as like this, uh, this piece is still exhibited in the, um, in the in the Musée d'Orsay. She didn't pay like a lot attention to her sculpture, so she was working a bit in this, uh, a bit in sculpture, but well, her main attention was completely on paintings. Time was changing, time was going, and she was, uh, well, she was going, you know, with time. And at some point, so she became, uh, like, part of the feminist movement. And she, you know, turned into a bright figure in the European feminist movement. Well, as, as we all know, the feminist movement just, you know, started to, like, gain more and more power, and they needed, uh, well, more and more of intellectual women and strong women. Uh, like independent women. To begin with, she enrolled in the Société Le Droit des Femmes. It was created in 1883 uh, by local suffragette Bertine Auclair. After that, under the pseudonym of um, Pauline Aurel, on February 20, 1888, she uh, will publish her first article in the uh, article about well, rights, about women's rights, in the feminist newspaper La Citoyenne. Even though Julian allowed the women to study there and they were, you know, teaching them uh, seriously, uh, it was still banned, this type of movement, this type of talks that, you know, women are equal to men and stuff like that, it was still banned from Julian's academy. So, well, you could study, you can draw, but, like, don't think that you are equal to us or something like that. In this period of time, so she, you know, completely remastered herself in terms of relationship and she was like well okay i don't actually want to get married i you know i don't want to fall in love with anyone and this is like the period of time that she stopped you know to 
flirting with men and stuff like because at this till this period of time uh you know man was constantly in her life so she's they were constantly flirting with her they was constantly trying to marry her or something like that so she was uh, always like uh, like men always paid attention to her and as i said she was a playful one she was a playful figure and she sometimes also was you know playing with them flirting with them but now she decided like no i actually don't need anything you know i know my aim i know what i want to do and well you know she basically well, married art in july of 1881 she visited ukraine uh, one more time with her family this time they came to Kiev and they came to Kiev Pecherska Lavra so this is a very old monastery here in Kiev which is situated um, situated on the hills of uh, Dnipro River it's like in the center of Kiev and well it's I mean it's it, I mean it's an old one so it was found in like 1051 and uh, well the main concept is that there were some of the um, caves so the monks they were living in these caves and they were like dedicated to religion like that well basically you know like uh the monks that are living on Af afon uh so it's a bit like same thing a uh, bit same concept and uh yes yeah, so they came there and they visited the caves so we have there such thing you know that uh, well, maybe you can go on excursion like that um so it's a cave a very small place very dark uh very you know like well back then it was wet and i mean it was okay it was uncomfortable because now i think they made something with ventilation something like that because uh well, to preserve everything there and this everything is bodies <laughs> bodies of the monks uh that were like you know that then became saint or something like that and like basically there's like this you know like i don't know i think it's like meter and a half two meters wide corridor so this is like this little little like uh walk here is like bodies of their saints or lane it's a very creepy place i'm not gonna lie i mean i was there once so my grandma uh at some point she um she thought that it would be actually a very nice idea to take a six-year-old to go to look at um dead bodies uh you know that that they're already like 100 200 300 years old and i mean i freaked out a bit not gonna lie i'm not claustrophobic or anything but you really feel yourself trapped there and especially that there's like no light you you know you're going with the candle there and uh, yeah so so they came to kiev uh, kiev to visit this uh, caves to see the saints and stuff like and i mean she was describing something that you it, like but obviously things back then were even worse than it's now because now it's a little bit more well as we can say civilized you know they are hidden uh everything's like fine so there's like nothing too much but back then she was something writing that well basically all of this was open and you could clearly see these bodies and stuff like that so um yeah i mean skeletons are not so creepy to be honest and uh, so i mean we had an archaeology practice on the first year of university and uh like one of the things that we were doing we were uh, you know cleaning the skeleton remains from the, from the from dirt uh and uh and well i you know i i'm not gonna say that i was freaking out or something like that i will even tell you like you know in the contrary so sometimes you know you would like wash it or something you would you know take this scalp and you will just like go and like turning it you know look, looking at all of this and stuff like this uh you know at some point you will be doing something you will like cleaning it and the yeah. tooth will fall out and you'll be like god damn it you would try to find this tooth again because nothing can be uh lost everything needs to be preserved like every like even smallest detail and you would like, you know <laughs> take this skull and go like god damn it get back this tooth you know and i was sitting sometimes and i was like looking at all this and i was literally reminding myself that um that is a real person 
I mean, that was once a real person that actually, like, lived here in Kiev, like, probably somewhere here, you know, in this, like, part of the Kiev, like, maybe even down the street somewhere. And, uh, yeah, so, I mean, I had this type of thing, and I know that, uh, well, half of my group, they also had this, you know, we were sometimes sitting and being like, oh my god, those are actually real people. <laughs> this is not prop or something like this, this is real human beings that once were alive so uh so yeah so it's not so freaky as one may think uh i think you know when you find a body that is still with flesh this is freaky this is like a bit disgusting but skeleton remains they're fine it's it's not it's like not so bad to be honest uh but yeah i'm sorry again again get being distracted so yeah, so they came to these caves and stuff like this, well, to pray or whatever, or just because they wanted, I don't know. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, because, you know, they were going into these caves and stuff like this, as I said, very cold, very, well, back then it was uh, dark, damp, uh, cold places. So it uh, obviously affected Maria's tuberculosis pretty badly. Her pain started to get even more. Uh, however, she still was painting in this period of time because, you know, art at this point, it was like the only thing that was distracting her from this pain. And uh, obviously she continued and she was supporting herself like that. In October of 1881, they uh, then traveled to Spain where Musa, well, they, they got there to rest, uh, but she was like, no, uh, I need things to do. <laughs> she was visiting galleries, she was vi visiting museums, uh, she was, uh, you know, going to different factories even. Uh, she managed somehow to negotiate with the prison authorities uh, in Granada, so they would like, let her in and she would be able, you know, to make some kind of drawings, uh, some sketches of the prisoners. So she was constantly sketching, painting uh, everything that she was, she was seeing and uh, so, so far as I remember I read that she was like she, well she she fell in love with Spain she really liked Spain she was very fond of this country and of what she saw but uh, you know tuberculosis at this point as I said was getting worse worse and worse so she you know her time was getting even like less or less or less so you see maybe maybe she would live a bit longer if she wasn't working so hard and she was not you know pushing herself so badly uh, maybe she would survive and live as I said a bit longer well at least maybe another decade or like 15 years um, but uh, yeah and doctors were very realistic with her and they were telling her openly that you don't have a lot of time you know, the tuberculosis is getting very bad and she was still very hard on herself and she was writing in her diary that she was again writing that how could I spend so much money on so much time on nothing why haven't I started to do this earlier and you know she was bashing herself very much and eating herself maybe this also you know it kind of you know because I think that a lot of you will agree that uh, this um that our psychological state is uh, um well, it's affecting it's affecting a lot how you are going through some very hard uh, diseases and well Maria Bushkirtso she died uh, in 1884 even just like 26 year old like very young very short life and uh, well it, as it was said she died pretty suddenly so it wasn't something you know just it's she started to decline 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 and she died it was as I said, kind of sudden, suddenly, uh, and she is now, so she is buried at the Passy uh, Cemetery in a crypt designed by her friend um, Bastien Lepage, and it is said that it um, has furniture, an easel, and a painting holy women there. So her diary now at this point uh, consists of uh, 106 handwritten volumes, uh, and it is like approximately, like it's more than thousands of written pages. On the preface to her diary, she wrote, A woman's life recorded day by day without any ostentation, as if no one in the world should read what was written. And at the same time, with a passionate desire that it be read. And immediately after this uh, diary was published, so post-mortem after her death, it became a bestseller. So people were really fascinated, like considering that, you know, she started this diary when she was just 12 year old, 
were very like surprised about the thoughts of 12 year old and just overall how open she was with herself uh although you know the first editions they got so the well the eldest maria maria the mother babanina she uh, well she very heavily edited the first edition she cut out a lot of things a lot of you know very controversial things uh a lot of things about so uh musa she was writing about uh, a lot of people like what she thought about them and sometimes she would write some kind of critics you know she would bash someone or write something very bad about them and just overall was like writing that she doesn't like like them she cut off also all of the mentioning about well i mean not all but you know some of the very hard uh, moments in family life so no one would know all these arguments and stuff like that she got out also some kind of so apparently there was some kind of uh erotic even uh, moments you know she like musa she described sometimes some erotic dreams that she had about uh about whatever she 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 was like imagining there and uh, the the original though was um what it was found in 18, 1980s by the french researcher colette cosnier uh, and well as i said it's an original and it's like um, completely another thing uh, and it is like much more interesting obviously uh, so it's like thousands of pages uh, that's presented to the public completely different woman uh, much you know deeper more honest more open uh, more brave, like bigger, you know, more like with larger personality than in this edited version. And so, you know, she showed that, uh, you know, this is a diary of an artist that was reflecting on the period of time that she was living in. And at some point, even uh, what was, you know, going a bit ahead of, of her time. About paintings in total, we have what we have left, be uh, like she left behind 150 paintings, 200 drawings, a lot of sketches and also several sculptures. We After Maria's death in 1885, the Society of Women Artists and Sculptors, they organized her exhibition where they presented like they you know could manage to take um like almost 100 works uh so it was like yeah, 100 oil works six pastels 124 drawings five, five sculptures very very uh large exhibition and even in this period of time france buys um Bashkirtseva's, uh painting meeting that was presented in the salon uh in the of um, 1884 uh, and like friends buys this painting for the Luxembourg uh, Museum. Today, overall, her works are pretty rare uh, because many of them were lost during the Second World War. They are mostly now situated in the Western museums in Western Europe um, because, as far as I remember, we like in Ukraine we have just three originals and one of them is in Kharkiv right now. So I. You know again a part of people and stuff like this is this is the common sense this is like just a thing that didn't even need to be mentioned uh i hope that this work is fine because well Kharkiv is in a very bad state now it's constantly being bombed and you know even though they are not like physically very near the city because it's liber this territory is already liberated but they're still you know firing missiles like all the time into the uh, living part of the of the city and so they're just basically destroying the city i mean all of the museums right now they are you know all of the collections are now in funds so they are technically safe the only thing that might be damaged is the building uh which in itself you know a lot of museums in itself they are situated in a historical buildings for example this day that few missiles will like hit like literally of the center of kiev and uh one of them hit at the playground in in the park uh so this is you know this park is like um divides uh, this is the university of taras Shevchenko. so this is one of you know our the most prestigious university uh in ukraine and uh right like across the street is uh, uh some of the residential buildings and we have two museums like uh the kiev uh, Kiev painting gallery, I don't know how to call, translate it right, 
so this is um, this building once were uh, was the building of um, uh, of the family Tereshchenko and Tereshchenko they, they were very rich people very rich Ukrainian family magnates you know they were also um, developing art and stuff like this paying for people so it was very famous and very uh, important family and uh, so this uh, this museum was uh, well all of the windows are completely out and uh, at some point so um, they have you know this type of gallery that is like like enfilade and uh, the, the end of this enfilade is the room with this um, glass roof yes and this glass roof is uh, out <laughs> it's it's broken a bit i mean the structure is stained but the glass is completely you know this uh, i mean i hope now they fixed it somehow and i mean and, and it was great it was good because all of the paintings that were out of the world they are in the uh, font so mm, like paintings they did not uh, uh, paintings were not damaged. Uh, same thing happened. So there is this this museum, and another one is the museum of the um, named after Bogdan and Varvara Hanenki. So also like it's the largest uh, collection of uh, like European art and Asian art, especially. So there's like a big collection of Asian art, uh, and and I mean different Asian art. So starting from Middle East, and then with like Chinese, Japanese art. And um, yeah, so they also the building also got damaged, uh, pretty much. Uh, so yeah, yeah, again getting destructed. Also interesting thing that uh, her paintings also uh, can be seen in Louvre because uh, Louvre actually actually this is how I found out about her because I saw this fact uh, that uh, Maria Bashkirtseva was uh, like one of the first women uh, whose works were bought by Louvre so they they bought her works and you can see uh, see them there Nice also has uh, a lot of pain of her paintings they are also uh, in Nice it, it was actually written that it's uh, uh, it's 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 tell me uh, has her paintings on permanent display in uh, Musée des Beaux-Arts de Nice also uh, there is a uh, well pretty like short but still there is a street named after Maria Bashkirtseva in Nice and as I said in Ukraine unfortunately we have just three pieces in different museums at the end of this diary so Maria Bashkirtseva wrote and this is how we'll, I will end this video with her words that if I do not die young I hope to live as a great artist but if I die young I intend to have my diary which cannot be interesting published this is everything that I have to, for today for uh, about her. Very fond of her works. Uh, as I said, I myself, you know, was preparing. There was new material for me also. So I was learning something new with, with you. And uh, this thing also, I'm pretty sure that the biggest part of you haven't heard about her. As I'm always saying, the most important thing for me is that you find out something new for yourself. And uh, yeah, and I hope to see you in the next video. So I will be, you know, we will get a bit distracted. Um, from this themes of photography, of art, and I think we'll get back a bit into decorative arts because I found another uh, another material that I already have about textile. So um, I I I like textile, <laughs> and I really love the history of textile. I don't know why. Uh, I think it will be a bit boring for some of you but well <laughs> we'll see we'll see oh so, yeah so stay safe and hope to see you in the next videos bye bye